Well, today we're continuing our Christmas series that I'm calling The Prophetic Fingerprint. And throughout this series, we're gazing on Old Testament prophecies that point forward in anticipation to the Messiah's coming, to the coming of the long-expected and promised Savior. His coming that we celebrate at Christmas, very specifically, but we ought to celebrate all the time, is predicted with incredible specificity throughout the pages of the Old Testament. And as a result of this incredible specificity, uh, as a result of these predictions, we have what I like to call the prophetic fingerprint. If you were here just a couple of days ago as we uh, had a wonderful Christmas Eve service together, you might have noted that we read several, several of the readings were passages of Old Testament prophecy. And we sang the song, a Christmas song that I love so much, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Long expected, predicted in the prophets. A unique and specific picture is painted showing forth the identity of the promised Messiah hundreds and hundreds of years before he came. And this means that this Christmas together, we're focusing on the greater picture. We're considering together God's perfect plan to send his son. We're turning to the pages of the Old Testament before Jesus came and asking, what child is this? What makes the manger so significant? What is Christmas about? Anyway, in a few weeks back, we considered God's promise to King David that someone from his, from, uh, his line would be on the throne forever. There's a key word in 2 Samuel 7. It's repeated over and over again, and it's simply this, forever. And building on God's forever promise to King David this morning, we're going to turn to Isaiah, and specifically Isaiah chapter 9 in the first seven verses. It'll be on the screens behind me, but I'd invite you to turn there in your Bible. And this passage undoubtedly points forward to the Messiah, and it's this passage it's in this passage that we read the familiar words that are quoted at Christmas so often. I've seen them posted on Facebook. It's a wonderful thing. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. That's from Isaiah chapter 9. That's from hundreds and hundreds of years before he came. The New Living Translation focuses on this theme and titles the passage this way, Hope in the Messiah. No question about it, amazing claims about the identity of the Messiah, God's promised Savior, are made in these verses, and this was prophesied uh, somewhere around 700, probably a little bit more than 700 years before Christ came. Uh, I'll go ahead and read the passage again. This is Isaiah chapter 9, the first seven verses. But there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun, and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. <clears throat> the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelled in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his uh, oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and, and with righteousness, from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, will do this. Friends, the only fitting response to what's said here, once we begin to grasp the earth-shattering things that are said, is wonder, actually more than that, 
awe. Let's jump into and consider some of the details together. This is a prophetic picture of hope anticipating the Messiah's coming. Verse 1, of course, begins, but there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. And following that, the territories of Zebulun and Naphtali in the northern part of Israel are specifically mentioned. Those are two tribes. And the background here is important. The context here is an impending invasion by the Assyrians. That's what their reality at the time of Isaiah. And the Assyrians were the brutal world superpower at the time of Isaiah. And Isaiah 7.17 mentions them saying this, The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day Ephraim departed from Judah the king of Assyria. Those words were frightening. Frightening words of judgment and discipline. Assyria was coming. Coming in judgment. It's part of God's plan. As a consequence for rebellion and idolatry. And the area of Zebulun and Naphtali in northern Israel, I'll have a map in just a moment, suffered greatly. They actually were the first to experience the full force of the Assyrian oppression. Because that's how the Assyrians entered Israel. 2 Kings 15.29, just a couple of selections from that verse, says this. Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, came and captured Gilead and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali, and he carried the people captive to Assyria. So you say, what happened? He carried the people as POWs to Assyria. And he said, how bad were the Assyrians? Well, I'll try to not be too graphic, but they were known for uh, terroristic and brutality, in, you know, terroristic oppression. And, uh, you know, the Romans were known for crucifixion, but crucifixion was a development on the method of execution that was practiced by the Assyrians that was simply impaling people on stakes. If you resisted the Assyrians, that's what happened to you. So when you see that the Assyrians are coming, it's a gloomy message, right? Catch the first part of that, that ver- uh, verse 1. It, horror, trembling, just the most awful things you can imagine. They're coming, and they're coming in judgment. But that's not the end of the story. Because this area, Galilee, was also where Jesus grew up. Anybody remember the town, the town of Nazareth? And also, this region, the region of Galilee, that's like Zebulun, Naphtali. Was the center of much of our Savior's earthly ministry, specifically centered in the city of Capernaum. Maybe we can put a map up behind me here. Got a couple of them. Now here, let's see if I can... This is Naphtali, and this is Zebulun, so you can kind of see that area there. That's the Sea of Galilee. Let's go to the next one. Now this is, uh, that was the Old Testament. This is now the New Testament. This is the time of Christ. And you see that area that was, I just mentioned as Zebulun and Naphtali is now Galilee. And that's Nazareth. I'm pointing right at it. That's Capernaum. Let's go to the next one. And there again, you can see the outline of Galilee, Nazareth, and Capernaum. So gloom was not the only message for this area. Yes, were the Assyrians coming, but was there a greater story? Now if we can go to the next map, we can kind of set this into the world picture. You can kind of see that. That's this area. Assyria is over here, and they came in from the north. There's the Sea of Galilee and hit uh, the area of Galilee or Zebulun and Naphtali first. The point of Isaiah 9, 1 and 2 is actually referenced in Matthew. Chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. It directly quotes it, as a matter of fact. The land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea. That's talking about a highway running from the Euphrates River all the way to Egypt. But the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region of the shadow of death, on them has a light dawned. Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2, friends, looks forward to the day when the one who claimed for himself, I am the light of the world, would walk 
and teach and heal right in that region. He would set foot in the place of darkness and gloom. Galilee, the shores of the lake or the Sea of Galilee. Think of calming the storm. Think of walking on water. Think of the feeding of the 5,000 right after a crossing of the Sea of Galilee. Think of the setting of the Sermon on the Mount and so much more. Galilee. The message isn't only gloom. There's hope beyond the gloom. This looks forward in hope to the Messiah and to the joy that he brings. And we know who he is. His name is Jesus. And then in verses 3 through 5, the victory of the Messiah is compared with God's victory over Midian. I don't know if you caught, depending on what your translation says, it might have mentioned the day of Midian's defe defeat. Uh, the ESV translates it a little bit differently, but in the day of Midian's defeat. I don't want to go into a whole lot of detail here, but this looks back to God's deliverance of his people through the hand of a judge named Gideon. And God brought it about an amazing victory, although he was incredibly outnumbered. I'd encourage you to read Judges 7 and 8 on your own time if you want all the details. But for now, the point here is that God promised to ultimately deliver his people uh, from the immediate oppression of Assyria, but ultimately beyond Assyria from all their enemies. And God promises that he will do it as he did earlier in the day of Midian's defeat. And that leaves us listening and looking at verse 5. Listen again to these words. What's said is earth shattering. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. This seems to say in poetic imagery that military equipment will be burned presumably because it is no longer needed. And that brings up some questions and brings us to the amazing picture of the identity of the promised Messiah. Listen again to verses 6 and 7, the prophetic fingerprint. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And get what's said next. This is an earthquake. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. A child is going to be born, a royal son from the line of King David. He would be born in perfect fulfillment of God's forever promise to King David. And this child to be born is no ordinary child. And understandably, much has been said and written about each of the throne names or titles there in verse 6. We read, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And honestly, this morning, we can't even begin to mine the depth of what's said here this morning, but I want to make a couple of vital observations. When we read the titles or the throne names, Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God, we're pointed to a couple of things. We're pointed to both his divine, perfect wisdom and his power. The royal son, the king to be born, is God, and as God, he is all-powerful. The theological word is omnipotent. God is all-wise, all-knowing, omniscient, and all-powerful, all-wisdom, all-knowing, all-powerful. And you say, okay, why don't we bring that up? Friends, if you want comfort this morning, Don't look for some hollow, happy talk. It's hollow. You want perspective and comfort and grounded comfort that's unshakable? There's one 
who is all-knowing and all-powerful. That changes things. Right? That should change our perspective on absolutely everything. And as king, he will carry out a royal program that will cause the entire world to marvel. He will accomplish his perfect purposes through his limitless wisdom and power. And in Isaiah, the picture of God's greater plan is developed in chapters 11 and in chapters 24 to 27, which look forward in, uh, eschatologically to eschatology, to, the, to the, uh, God's ultimate purposes in the future. You can read chapter 11 and chapters 24 to 27 in your own time. But for now, we're going to keep moving and we're going to see another title. Did you catch that he's eternal? Did you catch the title, Everlasting Father? The coming king will care for his subjects forever. That was a title for a king. And this is saying, the coming king will care for his subjects, how long? Everlasting, forever. And finally, we come to the title, Prince of Peace. And the idea here is the Hebrew concept of shalom. Now, I imagine that some of us have heard uh, this word before. Have you heard the word shalom? It's, a, it's restoration of complete peace and wholeness to this troubled world. Friends, do we live in a troubled world? Well, gaze into your own heart for just a few moments. And you'll say, yes, it's troubled. And then, I don't know, turn on the news for, say, five minutes. You might not even need that long. 30 seconds. We live in a troubled world, and creation groans. We long for shalom. And shalom is an important theme here, because remember, verse 5 spoke of a time in the future about no longer needing military equipment, and then add to that what verse 7 says, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And that leaves us face to face with a significant question. Who is this promised Messiah from David's line? Who do these amazing statements point to? We're talking about the king who will reign forever from the line of David in perfect fulfillment of God's promise. And this amazing prophecy rests on the certainty of God's nature. He always keeps his promises. And the last part of verse 7 puts it th this way. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The New Living Translation paraphrases it paraphrases it, the passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. That contemporary song, the God of Angel Armies, that phrase, that's what this is talking about. Lord of hosts will make this happen. Now when we step back for some perspective, just think about it. Chapters 7 through 12 in Isaiah is titled by scholars the book of Emmanuel because the theme of Emmanuel is found over and over again in Isaiah chapters 7 through 12. Isaiah 7.14, quoted in Matthew, by the way. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Of course, if you've read at Christmas recently, Matthew chapter 1, you say, I've heard those words. Yes, the prophetic fingerprint. And here in chapter 9, the identity of Emmanuel, of the Messiah, is described in even more specific terms. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Friends, Christmas is amazing. This is the identity of the one who is in the manger. Christmas, friends, is so much more than a sentimental story about a cute baby boy. Please don't fool yourself into thinking that you can leave him in the manger. He's God. He's the king, and he demands and deserves our worship. So let's think even a little bit more about this passage. These words of prophecy indeed point to Bethlehem but they also point beyond it, anticipating in hope the king's total victory. 
We need to do some careful thinking. This is undoubtedly an amazing picture, wouldn't you agree? And I trust that you would agree that the only fitting response is wonder and awe. I'm thinking of the Christmas carol, I wonder as I wander. Wonder. And undoubtedly, this points to Bethlehem 2,000 years or so ago, to Mary and Joseph, the shepherds and the angels, but it points beyond that. Jesus is the king from the line of David who will reign forever. The first words of the New Testament, Matthew 1.1, point to this as well, saying simply this, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, fulfilling God's promises to David and Abraham. And despite the sins of the kings who led Israel and then after the kingdom split into two, led Judah, the kings from David's line, who rebelled against God, in spite of that, and there was a lot of that, at the time of Isaiah there was a king named Ahaz. And he was horrible. I encourage you to look him up. Uh, read about Ahaz. Awful. Idolatry everywhere. Horrible. But in spite of all that, in the midst of all of that, in the midst of that brokenness, God kept his promise. God always keeps his promises. God always keeps his promises even in the midst of our sinful messes. And when he keeps his promises in the midst of our sinful messes, he shows forth his glory. Jesus is king. And Isaiah 9 points forward to his coming and beyond it. Much of what's said here, I'm convinced, remains yet to be fulfilled. We tend to automatically associate these words with Christmas, and that's fine. That's probably because of Handel's Messiah, which is an absolutely wonderful piece of music, isn't it? And we uh, think of the words set to music, for to us a child is born. But uh, it points forward to what we celebrate at Christmas, but it has to point beyond it. Just think with me for a minute. Let's pick up that subject of peace, that subject of shalom. Remember, verse 5 talked about no longer needing military equipment, and verse 7 speaks about the enduring peace brought by the Prince of Peace. And if we were to turn back in Isaiah just a little bit to chapter 2 and verse 4, we would see this picture of the shalom that is coming. He will judge between the nations and decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, nor shall they train, learn war or train for war anymore. That's also found in Micah chapter 4 and verse 3, by the way. Uh, does that sound like today? Just think about that. I'd say no. It's interesting, by the way, if you're kind of curious. Um, there's a statue in New York outside the United Nations that has uh, w is tr uh, artistic depiction of someone uh, building, uh, you know, be, uh, converting a sword into a plowshare. The irony of that, of course, is that this will not be brought about by the United Nations. Not at all. No human effort will bring this about. The King of Kings and Lord of Lords will. Isaiah 11, also picturing this coming shalom, verses 6 and 7. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, and, the young ch little, um, and their young shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like an, like an ox. Let me just ask the honest question, does this sound like it describes today? No. And that's especially, if you asked me, does that describe today, I'd say no. And it would be especially true if, I, if you'd caught me after I just turned on the news uh, for just a couple of moments, or if I rolled my eyes over the headlines, peace is not, what th not the word that comes to mind, right? So where does this leave us? What do we do with all of this? Well, let's think carefully for just a few moments, carefully and precisely. The Prince of Peace has come, and as a result of his coming, peace with God is available. 
The offer of peace with God is freely extended because the Prince of Peace has come. Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yet, we are waiting in expectation and hope for the full realization of what's described here. We're waiting expectantly for Jesus' return. Now, it's my understanding that this passage provides a prophetic picture that links the first and second comings of Christ. Yet, from a distance, it can be difficult to discern what applies to his first and, to, and what to his second comings. And not all scholars would 100% agree with this, uh, but I'll, I'll share my perspective on it. From the vantage point of, say, 700 years or so before Christ, it's like looking at a complex mountain range. Imagine you're in eastern Colorado. You're not to the Rocky Mountains yet, but you see mountains, and then you see more mountains behind them. But they're not all at the same place. There's a significant valley between those front mountains and those that come behind, right? But from a significant distance, it appears in two dimensions. It looks like a, 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 they're all in one plane. The space between the two, the depth, if you will, is difficult to discern from a distance. A similar thing is true when one looks into a telescope and trains and looks at the stars and, and gazes with wonder and says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Yes, they do. But did you know that uh, physicists tell us that those are thousands and millions and of light years apart? I don't even know how to wrap my mind around that. But they're far apart, right? Stars are not close. If they were, that would be bad because if we were close to stars, we'd cook. But again, when you gaze through a telescope, the depth is difficult to discern, is it not? So even though Isaiah couldn't fully perceive it, there's a space between his coming in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago and his glorious return. So Isaiah 9 links the two events. It looks forward to Bethlehem, to when he came and was laid in a Bethlehem manger. And it looks forward in hope when he comes back in total victory. And Jesus' return is something that believers should be waiting for expectantly and joyfully. Christians have pray, prayed the words of Revelation 22:20 20 for 2,000 years. A simple and profound prayer. Come, Lord Jesus. When we realize that this world is not characterized by shalom, though we are thankful for peace with God, we realize that creation groans, that this world is broken, that this is a place of suffering and difficulty, that it's it, all too common, right? What do we respond? Come, Lord Jesus, make it right. We live our lives in the midst of what theologians call the already but not yet tension. The kingdom of God is here, but it is not fully and completely realized. The king has come, and yet he's coming back, and we wait for the day of his return when he will fully and completely set up his kingdom. Think about it. These words were tremendous words of comfort and hope for the suffering people in Isaiah's day. Remember, Assyria was coming, and it wasn't good. Some 700 years before Christ, these people heard a message of comfort and hope. And these words ought to be words of assurance and comfort and hope for us as well. We long for justice and righteousness. We long for what is pleasing to God to be highly regarded. We long for perfect peace. We long for shalom. We long for the day when we don't hear our vocabulary no longer has categories for murder. Suffering, pandemics, war, cancer, evil. We long for an end to the news of evil and injustice. And friends, should we work for a greater justice today? Yes. But we must humbly acknowledge that it is not possible to achieve ultimate justice in this life this side of glory. But the day is coming when the king will return. It's not here yet, but it's coming. 
Jesus is coming back. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. And when he comes, the armies of heaven will be following him, and he will fully and completely set up his kingdom. And just as his first coming happened perfectly according to God's unshakable, indestructible, and unchanging, his perfect plan, his second coming will be just the same. Not a moment early and not a moment late. His coming, he's coming back and there will be perfect peace. God will do what he says he will do. He always keeps his promises. Read Revelation 19 and 20. The king comes back riding on a white horse. He has a name on him, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He comes back, total victory, and sets up his kingdom where he rules and he reigns. Revelation 20. Theologians call it the millennial kingdom. The day is coming. And we look forward in hope. And as a bit of an aside, it's interesting, but it goes right to this point. The great Christmas song that we sing, Joy to the World, it's really kind of wrapped around Isaiah 9 in a way. And when it was written by Isaac Watts, it wasn't about Christmas. He was thinking about the second coming of Christ. And you say, why do I say that? Well, think about it. No more let sin and sorrows grow. Is there sin today? Is there sorrows? You better believe it. He rules the world with truth and grace. The day is coming. It's come, but it's not fully come. He's coming again. Already, but not yet. I think joy to the world points to Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. It's the manger. But it points well beyond it. Looking forward in hope to the king's return. Now, as we conclude, I just want to jump to Luke and see how these things connect. Just a little bit. Luke chapter 1. Verses 31 to 33. I'll read it in just a moment. But reflecting on the prophetic fingerprint points us to the vital question, what's my response to the Messiah? What's my response to the King? And in Luke chapter 1, the birth of Jesus is foretold to his mother Mary by the angel Gabriel. And with that in mind, let's look at verses 31 to 33. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. That should sound like it echoes Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. Forever. The promised child to be born is to be named Jesus. That's what verse 31 says. The name Jesus means the Lord saves, or Yahweh saves. The point was also made to Joseph in Matthew 1.21 as the angel appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, She, that's Mary, will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. Jesus, the Lord, saves. The heart of Christmas is this. Jesus came to save us from our sins. He came to save. Friends, fellow followers of Jesus Christ, incredible hope is found in these words. We look back to his coming, the manger 2,000 years ago, but that isn't the end of the story. He's coming back, and his kingdom will never end. So ask that heart-searching question yet again. What's my response to the king? Have I bowed my knee to King Jesus? Have I surrendered to him? You see, the bad news is simply this. It's really bad. We're sinners deserving death. By default, we're rebels against our Creator. And we're completely unable to save ourselves. But the good news is better than words can fully capture and describe. God sent His Son, Jesus. His name points to His mission. His name says, the Lord saves. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He was born and laid in a Bethlehem manger. He lived a perfect life that led to the cross where He died as our substitute. Paying the penalty that we deserve for our sins. Of course, he didn't stay dead. He victoriously rose from the dead, conquering the grave and ascended into heaven. And he's coming back. And when he comes, he will fully and completely set up his kingdom. Sin will be finally and completely dealt with. And there will be 
in the glorious future for all who know Christ as Savior, and that qualification must be made for all those who know Christ as Savior. There will be no more death, crying, mourning, or pain. The word shalom. There's incredible joy and hope found in these glorious truths, no matter what the circumstances are that we currently face. Again, those questions, what's my response to the king? Am I a committed follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? This morning, if you can say yes, praise God. This Christmas, let's reflect with wonder and joy on all that God has done for us in Christ. And let's remember that Christmas isn't the end of the story. There's so much more. We have hope the king is coming back. But maybe you can't honestly say that you're a committed follower of Jesus. Maybe you can't honestly say that you've personally received the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. You might say, I like Christmas and all that stuff. I I like going to church. Yes, but have you personally placed your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to save you from your sin? Maybe you can't say that you've received the Savior personally. You know about him, but you haven't bowed your knee. Today could be the day. In these moments right now, you could pray that simply talk to God, tell the Lord Jesus that you are a sinner, that you are a rebel, and that you acknowledge that. Tell him you're abandoning all efforts to save yourself and that you're surrendering your life to him. Tell him you're placing your belief, your faith, your trust in him, in the Lord Jesus Christ, in him alone to save you. And the Bible tells us that the moment that that happens, we cross from death to life. From a rebel against God, deserving and headed to judgment, to covered by grace. Eternal life forgiven. Today could be the day. Don't leave this morning if you're wrestling with that. Talk to someone. Talk to me. Christmas is about the Savior. Jesus has come. Jesus is coming back. When we fix our gaze on those glorious truths, looking back to his first coming and to the message of the gospel and forward in expectation to his promised and glorious return, we are prepared to live grounded, gospel-centered lives for the sake of his glory these days. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in wonder you sent your Son. We just gaze with wonder on your plan to save, and we thank you for your grace. We thank you that there's a way. You have made a way. Help us to look back to Christ's coming and forward in hope to his promised and glorious return. May we celebrate and may we have opportunities to share this message with a world around us that needs hope. And it's in the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen.